This HIV update provides a review of oral screening examination and triage strategies for the medical team. This on-demand program was developed from a three-part webinar series presented by Dr. Carol Stewart. Dr. Stewart is a professor in the Department of Oral Diagnostic Sciences at the University of Florida College of Dentistry, Gainesville. She is currently board certified in both oral medicine and oral and maxillofacial pathology and maintains an oral health medicine private practice at the College of Dentistry. She is the former dental director of the FCAETC and was a faculty member from 1993 to 2014. The activity planners do not have any financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. The presenter will not discuss any off-label use or investigational product during the program. The speaker acknowledges permission to use some oral images for teaching purposes contributed by Dr. Jerry Bucco, Dr. Janet Lee, Dr. Don Cohen, and Dr. Indranil Bhattacharya. This slide set has been peer-reviewed to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest represented in the presentation. The following statements relate to continuing medical education and continuing education. This session is approved for up to 2.5 hours of CECME. This enduring activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the essential areas and policies of the Accreditation Council for continuing medical education through the joint sponsorship of the Florida AHEC Network and the Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center. This program has been developed from a three-part webinar. During part one of the program, the speaker reviews the importance of oral health and the need for integration into the overall care of the patient. Home care instructions and patient education strategies are discussed. The speaker reviews the normal anatomy and common benign conditions. A video demonstrating the procedure for performing an oral health exam is included. During part two of this program, the speaker reviews oral lesions associated with HIV infection and management strategies for oral lesions in HIV infected patients. During part three of the program, the speaker discusses triage strategies for oral lesions in HIV infected patients. The program ends with a discussion of several dental patient case presentations, which include recommendations for management and referral. In order to receive CE or CME credit, you must complete an evaluation survey, which includes a request for CE CME. The evaluation survey will be provided at the end of the video. When asked in the evaluation survey, indicate that CE CME is requested. You will then be directed to a survey that must be completed for our CE CME provider. The CE CME provider survey will include a post test assessment. You must achieve at least a 70% in order to receive CE or CME. Participants will be able to print or save their certificates after successful completion of the post assessment. Please note if you received CE or CME credit for the live webinars that took place on May 30th, June 27th, or July 11th, 2013, you are not eligible to receive CE or CME credit for this on demand module. No partial credit can be given for this module. Good afternoon, everyone. And this is a three-part series. Today is the foundation, and I'm hoping all of you can be with us for the part two and part three. But today will be uh, an introductory, why is oral health important? Um, some home care instructions. These are things that you can share with your patients, hopefully starting tomorrow. The medical uh, provider is really extremely important to coordinating and integrating the medical and the oral health. And so I'm hoping you'll have some uh, good take-home pearls from today that you can actually apply this afternoon or tomorrow. So after we've gone over the foundations of why oral health is important and some home care instructions and things that I think they're important for you to share with your patients, uh, we're going to go over some normal anatomy. Uh, these are questions that are sent to me a lot or asked by folks. Um, normal anatomy, but they're not really sure what it is, so I'm going to go over just a few of those with you. 
And then we're going to see a video on how to do an oral exam, the last part. Then we'll have the infamous post-test, and I will make it a point to give you the answers to these questions as we go through. Now then, the next two sessions, um, part two is going to be focused on oral lesions and manifestations in treatment that are associated with HIV disease. And then part three, um, which I think is really helpful if you're in a medical office, when someone comes in, has an oral problem, how do you assess it comfortably and how do you start getting that person transferred into care? So, big picture, so today, we're going to hopefully enhance your understanding of the importance of oral health, improve your recognition of normal anatomy, and then again go over the video. It's a short screening video. Okay, so who cares about oral health? Why is it important? I think probably everyone on this uh, webinar is keenly aware that oral health and systemic health are linked. The, the head's no longer separate from the rest of the body. These two are linked, and it's essential for all of us, uh, not just HIV infected, but it's essential for everyone uh, to have good systemic health. You need to have good oral health. Uh, there's a lot of links now every day becoming more and more prominent in the literature, linking good oral health with some kind of systemic problem. Uh, one would be cardiovascular disease. We know that periodontal uh, pathogens have been found in the uh, vessels, cardiac vessels and others, and they think that is promoting uh, atherosclerosis. We probably all know about the link between uh, diabetes and periodontal uh, disease. If you have diabetes, you're probably three times more likely to have some periodontal problems versus someone who doesn't have uh, diabetes. And after the glucose control is maintained for someone who is poorly controlled diabetic, then their periodontal disease and their insulin requirements sometimes will um, smooth out as well. Also, periodontal disease is important for uh, your pregnant patients. We know that some of the periodontal pathogens, you know, periodontal disease is a bacterial disease, a lot of gram-negative uh, anaerobic organisms. But uncontrolled periodontal disease has been linked with preterm um, birth, low birth weight babies. So having good periodontal care all the time, but especially during pregnancy, is, is quite important. Also, self-esteem and quality of life. This is important for all of us. Everyone likes to have a nice smile. Uh, it communicates so much, and it is a very important part of uh, self-esteem. And for the HIV AIDS infected individuals, sometimes this makes a difference, having a nice, confident smile between, between being social, working, or being a stay-at-home person who has a very poor outlook on life and those negative attitudes sometimes spin off into their medication compliance. So oral health is important for all of us, and it's particularly important for someone who is uh, infected with HIV or AIDS because, as you all know, they are immune suppressed and they are more prone to oral infections. HRSA has done studies, and they've stated that between 32 and 46% 40, of those living with HIV AIDS will have at least one major HIV-related oral health problem during the course of their disease. So therefore, I think the medical and dental community need to work together to take a look in the mouth, and if there are some oral concerns or problems, uh, address them quickly, because that, that really is the key. Now then, a lot of the patients will see their physician much more frequently than their dentist for a whole host of reasons. Um, they may be afraid to go to the dentist. They're afraid of fear. Uh, they may be afraid of stigma or discrimination. They may not be able to get an appointment. They may not have financial resources. As you know, the whole host of things. So sometimes 
and frequently they will see their medical provider more frequently than the dentist. So again, that's why uh, I think this kind of a presentation to make everyone more comfortable looking at the mouth is uh, helpful, hopefully, and appropriate. If you do needs assessments, and Ryan White and others have done several of these, lots of publications, the needs assessments will show that one of the most unmet need is dental care. That's one of the highest areas of unmet need would be dental. And the other thing that we've learned over time, and I think all of us know, dental decay and periodontal disease, gum disease, are both bacterial infections and they are both preventable. If they're not managed appropriately, as we see here, it can lead to death. A dental infection can cause a brain abscess, as this is what happened to this uh, unfortunate 12-year-old male. He had a molar tooth, uh, didn't get care appropriately in a timely manner, and the infection went to the brain, and uh, this poor young man died. So again, there is a huge critical need out there, a big unmet need for oral health. Again, just supporting why I think it's so critical for everybody to try and look at uh, the oral cavity. Now then, we're going to switch just a second here. I want to give you just some basic home care instructions. Ideally, uh, we would hope the patients would brush three times a day, at least two, okay, um, in the morning and at night, but preferably after eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, a soft but good toothbrush, a non-abrasive toothpaste, and fluoride. Uh, fluoride toothpaste is critically important to help diminish the susceptibility to tooth decay because folks with HIV and AIDS are at higher risk for tooth decay because of the lack of saliva, medications will cause some xerostomia. Uh, sometimes they don't have you know, adequate oral hygiene, and all of this sets them up for tooth decay. So, brushing two to three times a day, floss every day. Dental debridement, a professional dental debridement every six months makes a huge difference in their periodontal status. Again, a non-abrasive toothpaste. They can actually do harm with overuse of tartar control toothpaste and these whiteners. Um, overuse of whiteners is, uh, can be a problem. That's why there's an, a whole host of products out there now for sensitive teeth from whitening. So it's best not to overuse those products. Now, a big area is tobacco. Tobacco cessation uh, is something that I would hope you would promote. Perhaps the uh, dental case manager or medical case worker, if they uh, smoke tobacco, you can help them get set up with an appointment, get some tobacco cessation counseling, because what we have learned now that tobacco by itself, independent of CD4 counts, can uh, increase susceptibility to oral lesions. There have been studies that actually show that um, tobacco smoking, independent of CD4 counts, can increase susceptibility to oral lesions. Plus, we know all the things that tobacco does to the lungs and the oral pharynx, cancer, and so forth. So tobacco cessation would be helpful. And the other thing I would like you to uh, share with your patients is to avoid excessive alcohol. Alcohol is a desiccant for the mouth, and it will dry them out, uh, as well as, as we know, cause some other problems. Nutrition, biggie. Um, again, we need to have good teeth to chew, but I think informing them about overuse of sugar products, particularly things like the sports drinks and the sodas. Uh, a little education here can go a long way. Let me share this next uh, slide with you. This is really, I think, interesting. Uh, I share this with my patients and with my children and grandchildren and, and everything. pH, the acidity of some of these sports drinks and some of our favorite drinks can be a problem. 
We can see water is a neutral pH, 7.0. High is good, a low pH is not good because the lower the pH, the more the enamel can dissolve. If someone is drinking, we'll say, Coke Classic eight hours a day and letting it bathe their teeth with a 2.49 pH, that's not a good practice. You know, we can see battery acid. The most acidic thing we have is a 1.0 pH. Very acidic, very harmful. All of these uh, drinks have a pH below the critical pH of 5.5. At a pH below 5.5, remember that 5.5, your enamel is going to start to dissolve. And that's why prolonged exposure to these drinks can cause enamel to, to start to demineralize and promote tooth decay. So again, some good advice for your patients. Talk to them, give them a pamphlet, whatever. Um, the second column here, this is the pH. This is how much buffer it takes to titrate um, the mouth back to a neutral pH. As you can see, the titrate requirement for Red Bull is much higher than anything else. Uh, so Red Bull is not really uh, serious in terms of pH, but the buffering capacity might be a concern. So bottom line, don't overuse these and try to avoid having your patients use these 24-7. Okay? Now then, shift gears a little here. In a medical office, what we would hope we could accomplish would be to educate the patients about oral hygiene and encourage them for routine care, recognize oral concerns that need immediate attention, and oftentimes start the therapy. And this uh, bottom one will address more in part three, but I think there's certainly a lot of opportunity to start dental care in the medical office. And I'm hoping to set you stepwise to feeling more comfortable towards doing that. Now then, as far as normal anatomy, let's just start looking at the tongue. The tongue is uh, a very important place. And I want to talk about the papillae, taste buds and papillae in the tongue, because these can be uh, honestly confusing. Patients sometimes, when they start to look at their mouth, they'll see the circumvallate papillae back here, the V-shaped ones, the big ones, and they think there's a problem. Sometimes they're elevated like this and they're red. This is normal. And to an untrained eye, these papillae can also look a little alarming. But these are normal V-shaped uh, papillae. The filiform papillae are these little hair-like ones on top and we'll talk about those later, that's a keratin growth sometimes that can be overgrown and look long and be uh, what we call hairy tongue. Now, the foliate papillae are these longitudinal folds on the lateral tongue, these longitudinal folds of mucosal tissue on the lateral tongue, also taste buds, that sometimes are confused with pathology. Fungiform, again, are these little mushroom-shaped ones on top, um, they may get uh, inflamed at times, but this is what a normal tongue should look like. We have fungiform papillae, filiform, the long hairy ones, the foliate papillae at the back, which may get inflamed um, from time to time, and then the circumvallae on top. Normal papillae. And when we start to look at pathology, these will be important. Another thing we'll commonly see on the top of the tongue is this really, really attractive looking black hairy tongue. Again, this is an overgrowth of those hair-like filiform papillae and they're colored. And this can be from bacteria, from colored foods, bacteria, tobacco. And as we know, if a patient goes on antibiotics, um, the normal flora is wiped away. This, this can develop. Uh, having antibiotics can turn can uh, create this black hairy tongue. Bottom line, it is nothing to worry about. Here we have a hairy tongue that's white. This is where it's nice to educate your patient. They should brush their tongue once a day, lightly with a toothbrush, just boom, boom, a couple strokes forward. Um, every morning when they get up, we'll keep their tongue fresh and keep the desquamated keratin clear uh, from their tongue. So that's not a pathology, that's uh, more of a hygiene issue.
Fissure tongue. Don't worry if you see a lot of fissures and lines in the tongue. You may see this in someone who has dry mouth. This is usually a developmental um, concern that may, or a developmental process that will enhance with age, maybe not. Um, but again, a fissured tongue by itself is not a cause for concern. You will see it probably more common in elderly folks and those with dryness. Now, let's get into a little more benign pathology, what we call geographic tongue. We've probably all seen it, may or may not have recognized it. Don't know what causes this. This is a depapillation. Um, it is usually asymptomatic, but when it gets to be florid like the one on the right here, it may be become symptomatic. And what's happening is the uh, taste buds and papillae are simply atrophying. And the reason they call this geographic tongue is because this lesion moves around. So we have red where the papillae have atrophied, and then we have a white yellow serpentine border. And it'll be wavy, it'll be uh, here one place, next time you see the patient it might have moved up here. This one is very prominent on the right. This is less prominent, but it is still what we call erythema migrans, which stands for, of course, redness and migratory lesion, but we have coined it over the years geographic tongue. Does not become cancer, it is nothing to worry about, does not need treatment, just educate the patient, this is not a, a problem. Sometimes they are worried, they think this might be a cancerous lesion. Um, to an untrained eye, this actually could look like what we call the pseudomembranous candidiasis, so the white cottage cheesy type that you can scrape off, but of course, it is not. This does not scrape off. This does not scrape off. But it is, as a rule, nothing to worry about. Let me just show you a couple more here. This is the same patient. See how it can cover the dorsal tongue, the top, the lateral, and the ventral. Okay, don't let that alarm you. That's what we call geographic tongue, erythema migrans. Now then. Another common thing we see, but um, sometimes don't really know if this is a problem or if it's not, lingual varicosities. The uh, vessels on the ventral tongue, this is usually a condition that just may progress with age. It's not pathologic. It is not any kind of vascular lesion. It does not mean high blood pressure. It's just a fact of aging that you will see it. And sometimes these can look pretty prominent and almost a little scary, like a vascular lesion. But one thing that you can do to help help you is look the, at the other side. If you see the same thing on both sides of the tongue, then we figure it's probably normal for that person. Okay. Now then, let's go over a few more common benign conditions. Uh, to someone who's comfortable with the mouth, um, this may be reviewed, but I still wanted to go over some things uh, with you. Now then, these bony growths, midline, hard palate, when you palpate these, these will be hard, they will be firm. This is what we call torus palatinus, or the common term is maxillary tori. Um, these are pretty common, they're almost considered normal, but it's just a proliferation of normal bone. They do not need to be removed. Usually the patient will know they've been there for a long time, and they just may slowly grow with age. Um, the only time, I take that back, they might need to be removed if you needed to make an upper denture for this patient, then they would go to an oral surgeon and have this piece of bone removed because could not fabricate a denture over these pieces of bone. But these can have any appearance. If you palpate them, they're bony hard, they're asymptomatic, um, they're nothing to worry about. Now, because the tissue over these tori is so thin, they're commonly ulcerated. You know, a fork, a Dorito, anything like that can cause a little ulcer here. And they can look worrisome, but in a week it'll be gone and it'll be normal again. So maxillary tori, normal, pseudo, almost normal. Uh, 
in terms of the fact that we see it so frequently and it is normal um, but prolific bone growth. Midline hard palate. Oh, and these little what we call palatal rugae, little folds of tissue up here. If you see those, um, this is just a remnant uh, of biology, nothing to worry about. It helps food get chewed and helps push it to the back of the mouth. Normal anatomy. Those are palatal rugae. Okay, moving on. Like I said, we're just putting down some uh, foundation. Now, in the bottom, we have the same, the bottom jaw, same uh, normal exuberant bone growth that we had on top, only we call them mandibular tori, lower jaw tori. Um, not anything to worry about. They also get ulcerated. They can be a problem taking x-rays. They tend to get in the way. Um, and these may or may not be symmetrical. Okay, They may have larger on one side than the other. But they're normal. They're nothing to worry about. They're not tumors. They don't need to be removed. Now, similar exostoses. And these are things you, you know, may not look at very closely until you start to spend some time doing oral exams. You'll wonder, huh, you know, what is this? This is, again, bone growth. And we're not sure what causes this, whether it's occlusal forces or it's just aging, but it's normal bone, nothing to worry about. The patient will know that it's been there for a long time. So these are various ways that it might present. Now, since I had this um, available, this is tooth decay. These dark red, brown areas here. When, it, when you see tooth decay on the sides like this, this could be poor hygiene. This could be uh, dryness. Dryness, tooth decay that's from hyposalivation will oftentimes start right here where the gum and the tooth come together. Okay, So this is all decay. It's something that uh, would not need immediate dental care. I mean, not urgent emergency type, but you certainly should send this person to the uh, dentist to get some restorative work done here. Okay, soft palate. And I, I think looking at the soft palate is extremely important because sometimes this is where non-Hodgkin's lymphomas may start. We'll see this in, in the second part. But the normal anatomy would be soft palate, even tonsillar fossils here, uvula, the little tissue that hangs down. Um, if you don't see a uvula, sometimes these are cut off um, to help treat sleep apnea. Real long uvulas sometimes uh, are part of the treatment for sleep apnea, and sometimes they are also removed during tonsillectomies. But what I want to draw your attention to, all of this area in the soft palate, pharyngeal area, is full of lymphoid tissue. And you may get these little hyperplastic lymphoid nodules. Okay. These would not be uh, a serious concern. But again, if there is a concern, this is where I would go to the ENT person or the oral surgeon. Now, if you see a little bifid uvula like this, this is just where the two, two uh, processes of the uvula didn't quite fuse into one. This is not anything to worry about. This is not a tumor. This is not pathology. This is just a nice two-lobed uvula. And you've probably all seen these things, and not, you might have wondered about them, but now we can have a little more clarification as to what they really represent. Now we're moving inside the mouth. Inside the cheek is an important place to look. Uh, for one thing, you'll want to check the salivary flow and milk their stents and stuff, but sometimes your patients will have these white, leukoplakia looking like lesions on inside the cheek. If it's right there, where the upper and lower teeth come together, and it's a little bit hyperplastic like this one. This is probably um, safe to say related to cheek chewing. Ask the patient if they suck their cheeks or chew on their cheeks, and you'll see this. And oftentimes, you'll see the same kind of uh, hyperplastic leukoplakic area on the lateral tongue. Now then, we all get concerned when we see white lesions or red lesions on the side of the tongue. 
But this is a pretty classic tongue chewing. Ask the patient and then watch them. Six months, uh, try and help them break the habit. If there's ever any doubt, if you see this and they say they never, never chew their tongue, then it might be time for biopsy and make sure this leukoplakic patch is not dysplasia. But when you see a situation like this, you can be pretty well assured that this is uh, a benign issue. Now then, I wanted to share this with you because the lateral, uh, the line here on the inside, the buccal mucosa or the inner cheek, if it starts to look red and white mixed, then you may want to have a biopsy done. This is lichen planus, but also this could look like um, dysplasia, and this red, white, any red, white lesion inside the cheek can be dysplasia. So, very, very benign. Lichen planus is not anything to get extremely concerned about, but if you're not sure, obviously we would biopsy it. In my oral medicine practice, when I see lichen planus like this, I will biopsy it just to make sure that is what it is. Okay? Again, I'm just trying to give you a spectrum here of things. Oh, these are interesting little um, findings called Fordyce granules. These are actually sebaceous glands inside the cheek, inside the buccal mucosa. They may be inside the lips. And you may have seen them. They almost look like little pieces of uh, cholesterol, but they're not. These are ectopic sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands, as we know, are usually on the skin, but when they pop up inside the mouth, and they are very frequently found in the mouth. This is not something for you to get concerned about. Uh, your patient may ask you about them and just say they're sebaceous glands and, and they're okay. Uh, but again, another benign common finding. Okay. As I mentioned, I think it's important for all of us to assess salivary flow because a lot of our patients will have uh, decreased flow because HIV affects the salivary glands, and then the medications will uh, induce hyposalivation. And I wanted to make sure that um, this is a reminder to milk the gland. And in a normal person on the gland, on the uh, papilla that leads into stents and duct, if it's not inflamed, you can hardly see it. There's a little flap of tissue right up next to the second molar. And when you look inside, you usually can see it if you're looking for it. But here it helps us out because this one happens to have an aptus ulcer on top and it's very inflamed. Okay, so this is the little flap that goes into stents and stuff. Milk it, make sure that what's coming out of there is clear, fluid, uh, not yellow, or viscous. Uh, I actually had an HIV infected individual. When I milked this, it came out bright yellow saliva and the person had MRSA. Um, interesting finding. So it's, it's worth taking a few seconds to do that. And the last common finding I wanted to share with you is what we call amalgam tattoos. These are little stained areas of tissue. It's usually flat like these. It's usually blue-black. And it's because probably when the silver filling was placed or this one was placed, silver particles fell onto the tissue or got pushed into the tissue and it made a tattoo. It made a little stain. Um, you can ask the patient if they know it's there. If you're concerned, the dentist usually will find little particles of amalgam on the x-ray. But this is smooth, asymptomatic, totally not painful. It's usually been there for a while. Um, and you might find them on edentulist areas. And you may ask yourself, well, there's no filling here. But there was when that tooth was still there. This tooth has been removed, but the amalgam tattoo stays behind, just like any tattoo. These are little benign uh, entities we don't get concerned about. But the main concern about having any pigmented lesion on the gingiva, of course, is malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma, if you find one, and they're exceedingly rare, they will be more hyperplastic, usually blue-black. They will be usually in the interdental papillae area. And if you have any clinical suspicion or concern about a pigmented lesion, this is something we all biopsy. Okay? Don't be embarrassed. 
definitely any pigmented lesion, you probably should have it biopsy, unless you know it's an amalgam tattoo. Now then, we really like to entertain any questions about, again, normal anatomy or benign oral conditions. This question, yeah, this is the kind of thing we address in, in part three, but prior to a patient arriving at the dentist with severe caries or dental damage, anticipatory guidance should be given to the patient. What I, if they're at the dentist, then the dentist should uh, provide the proper therapy at that point. Uh, if they're in medical office, then they can have antibiotics given uh, until they get to a dentist or analgesics. But if you want to educate the patient, signs of real concern would be any swelling uh, that's rapid, rapidly expanding, any swelling that heads for the uh, stretch to go to the eye, like an eye tooth or a cuspid that would go to the eye, that's worrisome. And even more worrisome would be anything that causes swelling in the pharyngeal area, could block the airway. Uh, if their voice starts to change, they get that high-pitched wheeze, uh, airways becoming blocked, that's very serious, that needs urgent emergency care, and if they start to get trismus, limited opening, hurts to open, pain, uh, they need to either go to the dentist immediately or go to the ER. If they cannot get to a dentist, I would tell the patient if they have any of those signs or symptoms, go to the emergency room. And the same goes for a dentist or a physician who might prescribe an antibiotic. Um, if it doesn't work, they either need to come back to you, and if it starts to get worse, uh, quickly, they need urgent care. Again, we don't want folks um, having abscesses that cause brain abscesses or close off the airway, cause Ludwig's angina, and have someone uh, die of respiratory distress. Any other questions? If not, let's roll the uh, video. We have a yeah. video of an intraoral exam. Due to the increased awareness of the importance of oral health on systemic health, particularly in medically complex patients, it seems appropriate that we could review the key features of a head and neck screening exam. Hi, I'm Dr. Carol Stewart, and it's my pleasure to review those issues with you, share my thoughts in terms of the key features of an oral exam. Now, the focus of this exam will be simply to identify concerns that need to be followed up at a later time i.e. distinguish normal from abnormal. The key features that we'll be using in terms of diagnostic techniques will be one, inspection, and two, palpation, looking for any changes in consistency, firmness, uh, and tenderness to elicit a further follow-up. The extra oral exam actually begins when the patient first enters the room. You want to check for any obvious signs of asymmetry, distress, swellings, lesions, anything that appears, again, out of normal limits. That's our key focus here is to identify any problems that need further follow-up. So I'll just briefly, usually while I'm talking to the patient, introducing myself and saying hello, do a uh, general inspection for symmetry, eyes, ears, mandible, shoulders, and verify a lack of swelling, a lack of lesions, that everything appears within normal limits. Usually check in front of the ears, behind the ears, the neck, anything that's visible. I'll even sometimes check the shoulders and perhaps the hands. After having done so, then I like to check the chewing apparatus, make sure that there's no pain upon chewing or swallowing. Also make sure that the mandible can work freely and I'll just palpate 
put two fingers on the lateral poles of the TMJs, the condyles, ask the patient to simply open as wide as they can and close. Do that again. Also checking, as she does that, open once more, close, open, to see that the lower mandible opens in a straight line without deviation, close. Check for any popping, clicking, crepitus, any noises. You don't hear noises and there's no pain when you open and close. You want to confirm that with your patient. Now I'd like you to clench on your back teeth. That will flex the masseter muscles. Lightly palpate them, verify an absence of pain. Okay there? Okay. And then the other muscles I will check that have uh, a role to play in mastication, chewing, would be the anterior temporalis. You just lightly palpate. Let me know if there's any pain. Is there any pain? No. The other component of the extraoral exam would be the lymph node exam. Checking nodes for tenderness, enlargement, firmness, or even overlying erythema is very important as it might indicate an infectious process, disease, or even um, a metastasis of a carcinoma. So we'll begin our lymph node exam in the preauricular chain because I usually end up in the ear area. I'll begin by placing two fingers in front of the ear, palpating in a, usually a circular motion on both sides again verifying that there is no pain, tenderness, or firmness. At the same time I'll put my fingers behind the ear and check for the posterior auricular nodes as well. Also while I'm in this position I will check the back of the ear just to verify the absence of lesions or concerns. As I'm finishing the back of the ear I will check for the occipital nodes by running two fingers, the base of the skull, and then perhaps follow up with the thumb just to validate the absence of muscle tenderness as well as enlarged lymph nodes. The conclusion of that, I'll move on to the submandibular and the submental nodes. Now what I'd like you to do is just drop your head forward. Drop your head forward, perfect. Close. And I'll begin with the submandibular. I usually push the tissue to one side and just pull the tissue over the mandible and then in a circular motion feel for any enlargements or thickenings or any pain. Okay with that? Okay. Then I'll just slide onto the submental nodes in the center and just rotate two fingers to check for any firmness or nodes. If I have a concern when we do the intraoral floor of the mouth, we will check it again as well. Then I move on to the other chain of nodes, the anterior cervical and posterior cervical. These two nodes, chain of nodes, are in front of the sternocleidomastoid and behind it. I usually have the patient turn opposite real far so that the muscle becomes a little more prominent and then I'll just run my fingers, circular motion, down the anterior SCM, posterior as well. Then I'll do the same thing on the other side, real far. Here we can see the SCM is prominent. Check the anterior and the posterior. To conclude, we want to check the supraclavicular nodes, which are just above the clavicle. I just run my fingers along that, usually palpating in a circular motion for enlargements. Check these and do the same on the opposite side. Now then obviously if someone has a high shirt on, we might want to ask permission to expose this area if it's appropriate at the time. That pretty much concludes the external exam, the symmetry, the chewing, the mastication, and the lymph node exam. Upon completion of the extraoral exam, then we'll move into the mouth and do the intraoral exam. Begin by inspection with the lips, again to validate lack of lesions, pigmentations, swellings, 
are areas of concern. Then generally ask the patient to just try and relax their lower lip as you evert it. You inspect and palpate. Again, check for any firmness or lumps. Same on the upper lips. Then at the same time, you want to check the vestibule. Okay, open. And then that will lead us into checking the buccal mucosa, both right and left side. You may need a light. If you don't have a dental light, a pen light would work quite well. And you can check the integrity of the buccal mucosa. Again, looking for the absence of lesions, redness, swelling, or any other concern. This appears pink, smooth, no breaks in the mucosa. Now, while checking the buccal mucosa, you also need to check salivary flow. There are two ways to check salivary flow. We want to validate that the patient's flow is normal because it has a major impact on digestion and carry susceptibility. You want to check the parotid gland, looking at the papilla of Stenson's duct, which is at the about the second molar location. You'll want to palpate and milk the gland forward, visually checking that the secretions are clear and watery. Do this on both sides. Another way to also validate that there's adequate salivary flow is when the patient opens, you want to check the floor of the mouth and validate pooling in that area as well. You can also check the flow of the submandibular glands by milking forward. Again, and validating that the salivary expression is clear and watery, at least not extremely viscous. From there, we can move on to check the hard and soft palate. Open for me. You'll have to ask the patient to put their head back a little bit. Visually inspect the hard palate for the same things color, consistency, lesions, and integrity of the mucosa. Check the soft palate. We'll use a sterile tongue blade. I want you to just to say, ah, ah, perfect. At that point, you'll be able to visualize the tongue will drop down, the soft palate will rise, and you'll visualize the uvula and the oropharynx area. Again, looking for the absence of any purulence, swellings, or areas of concern. Uh, if the uvula deviates to right or left, that might indicate a concern that needs to be followed up. At that point in time, we want to do a further inspection of the tongue. Looking at the dorsum, we want to validate the absence of any lesions, nodules, and then we'll move on to inspect the lateral and the ventral aspects of the tongue. To facilitate that, you'll just ask the patient to stick your tongue out at me, and then you want to gently wrap the gauze around the tongue, pull the tongue to one side or the other. You want to check and palpate the lateral border, pull the tongue up, check the ventral, and again take another look at the floor of the mouth. Do that on both sides. You want to check, palpate, lift the tongue up. And at the completion of that, I will ask the patient to lift their tongue and touch the roof of their mouth, and I will check the ventral tongue in this fashion. Occasionally, in elderly folks, you may see pronounced uh, veins on the lingual aspect of the tongue, which would be normal varicosities. This concludes a review of the basic procedures involved in a routine head and neck screening exam. Extra oral exam, again, to recap, symmetry, TMJ, and lymph nodes, intraoral, lips, vestibule, buccal mucosa, teeth, gingiva, floor of the mouth, hard palate, soft palate, and salivary flow. Upon completion of your exam, any lesions or concerns noted, obviously will follow up at a later date. We hope this has been helpful. This is Dr. Carol Stewart thanking you for being with me.
Okay. Are there any questions about how to perform an exam? Um, one part we didn't see here was the uh, palpation of lymph nodes. Uh, that's part of the extra oral. Uh, the uh, chain of nodes, anterior cervical, posterior cervical, um, would be important to palpate, uh, make sure there's no tenderness, enlargement, um, and anything posterior cervical uh, would be important as well. Now then, one other thing I'd like to mention um, regarding oral hygiene practices that I didn't mention. We talked about a non-abrasive toothpaste and the importance of fluoride, any, anyone can encourage a patient to use a fluoride toothpaste and an alcohol-free rinse, like ACT or uh, something of that nature. Also, biotin products are great for xerostomia. But one thing some of your patients may do, it used to be thought uh, historically that peroxide rinses were good to prevent periodontal disease. We now know that straight peroxide rinses are not a good thing. In fact, they can be harmful because they flush out the uh, healthy bacteria. So if your patients um, ask you about peroxide or if you have a, an opportunity, uh, reinforce that peroxide rinses are no longer uh, considered a, a good oral hygiene practice. And actually, that can uh, induce uh, hairy tongue as well. What products contain biotin? Okay, biotin, when I say biotin rinse, what I was referring to is uh, commercial artificial saliva that has uh, two important enzymes in it, lactoperoxidase and lactoferritin that will help cleanse the mouth and help rinse it out and make the patient feel very comfortable if they have uh, dry mouth. So that was what I was referring to. It is an over-the-counter, non-prescription product. In fact, I'm pleased lately I've seen quite a few um, advertisements on the television for biotin. So uh, don't, for, you know, don't feel bashful about recommending it because it is a pretty good product. I appreciated your your use of gloves and of the light. Uh, uh, sometimes I uh, perhaps forget to use that light to uh, uh, good effect in terms of really getting a good exam of the some of the oral mucosa or underneath the uh, tongue. So I appreciated that reminder in the video. Well, actually, that's that's a good comment. Um, if you're in a medical office and you have the uh, the otoscope on the wall or the ophthalmoscope, you can sometimes use that light if you don't have a pen light, or you can adjust the light in the room. But if you have a dark room and you don't have a dental light, uh, pen lights work really quite nicely. I see there's a question here. If a patient has parotid enlargement chronically, will they have inflammation of Stenson's duct? Not necessarily. Um, chronic parotid enlargement, this is a great question, uh, can mean several things. Bilateral or even unilateral parotid enlargement in someone who is HIV infected could be the lymphocytic proliferation that we see sometimes uh, in folks with HIV disease. It may not be painful. It may be uh, just enlargements. Oftentimes, we'll see that in uh, pediatrics. One of the first signs of HIV is a bilateral parotid enlargement. Now, and Dr. Lawrence, feel free to chime in if you want on that one. Uh, also, if you have a chronic parotid enlargement, I think of things not just HIV, lymphocytosis, but you have to think about bulimia, diabetes. Hepatitis C can produce uh, parotid enlargements. Of course, Sjogren's syndrome can, do, can produce parotid enlargements. Um, if you have a unilateral parotid enlargement that's quite painful, then there's a very good chance that, especially if it came up somewhat suddenly, that the patient has uh, a stone. 
sialolith in Stenson's duct. And then you'll have inflammation, uh, or at least pain, whenever they eat or if they try and milk the gland because the blockage will, uh, saliva will back up behind that little blockage and it will cause an expansion and cause pain. I don't know how many of you out there have been uh, part of HIV care since the beginning, probably a lot of you, and you can remember back in early 80s when there were uh, a great deal of oral manifestations. We saw uh, several things and very frequently. Since the uh, introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy, the oral lesions have reduced, which is a good thing. Uh, some reports say they reduced from 10 to 50 percent. On average, uh, 30 to 35 percent reduction in oral lesions overall. One of the areas where there's been the largest reduction is oral candidiasis, and that's mainly due to the effect of protease inhibitors. Although, as we'll see, oral candidiasis is still prevalent, and it can still be the um, first manifestation that might clue you into HIV diagnosis in someone who is not diagnosed. So, if you're in a clinic and you see patients routinely and they are compliant with their medications and taking care of their oral health and so forth, and if they are compliant, you'll probably not see a lot of the manifestations we will discuss here. Uh, if they are not compliant and if they start to have concerns, then of course you might. And those are the things that we want to review today. So, significance of lesions. One, as we've already said, they can still be the first sign of clinical disease in someone who's not yet diagnosed. In someone who is diagnosed and is on therapy, it will signify or could signify disease progression. The, uh, say, well, the regimen is no longer working, the virus has become resistant to that group of medications, or the patient perhaps is not taking their medications, uh, which is something that's going to have a large downward spiral effect. It will impact their medication compliance if they have an oral lesion, it will impact their nutrition, it will impact also their overall quality of life. So oral lesions are more than just a sore in the mouth. They have pretty far-reaching ramifications, which is why we like to diagnose them early and treat them quickly. Now, don't gasp. We're not going to spend a lot of in-depth um, time on each of these, but this is the traditional outline of oral conditions, and it still holds. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about some of the fungal infections. We'll talk a little about periodontal disease, a few viral infections. We will talk about the malignant neoplasms. Uh, definitely want to be able to recognize those and some dysplasia. We're going to focus more on periodontal disease and dental decay, particularly dental decay and things like abscesses in part three. Okay, moving on. Predictive values for oral lesions. When the patient has a CD4 count that of course drops below 200 cells per millimeter cubed or their viral load goes over 20,000, uh, a lot of literature supports that that's when you're more likely to see oral lesions emerge. What's the most common oral manifestation of HIV AIDS and the first sign of disease? I think I've already given you that answer, which is oral candidiasis. And when you see this, and when you need to be suspicious, is when the patient is diagnosed, comes in with oral candidiasis, you treat it, and it comes back. You treat it again, and it returns. And by the second or third round in someone who's undiagnosed, you need to stop and say, okay, something is not quite right here. Uh, recurrent candidiasis is not something we should see in an immune competent population. So you need to think about things that could cause chronic candidiasis, uh, immune suppression, diabetes, if they're taking antibiotics, things like that. But when you've ruled out all of those, then you have to consider immune suppression and follow up on it. Now then, the classic symptoms, patient's gonna come in with oral burning, 
difficulty swallowing perhaps, things will taste different, and loss of appetite, which unfortunately can lead to loss of weight because they quit eating. So here we have a 22-year-old female who states, my mouth burns and it hurts to eat. Classic signs. Clinical picture, red flat patch in the midline of the hard palate. This is clearly uh, abnormal, this bright red. Also, this is what we call erythematous candidiasis, which means atrophic, red. And you oftentimes see, when you see palatal candidiasis like this, a matching tongue lesion. We call these kissing lesions because this fits basically right in the hard palate. So you may see uh, infection in both areas. This is very easy to recognize. I don't think any of us would miss that. This is a little more subtle, but sometimes it's very subtle. Um, this may even look like a pizza burn. But if someone comes in with those classic signs and symptoms, then you need to certainly consider erythematous candidiasis. Some of us will confirm the diagnosis with a smear or a culture. In some offices, they would uh, do a two-week trial of a topical antifungal if this is all we see. We'll move on. Okay, here's another example. 43-year-old male comes to the clinic with a concern that something was wrong with my mouth. Having severe discomfort, can I eat well or drink, chew or swallow? Again, food's not tasting right. And what we see here is the classic angular chylias. See the red ulcer and the commissures and the radiating white fissures? This is classic angular chylitis. Here we see with the mouth open. And generally, when someone has angular chylitis, you'll find that they also have oral candidiasis because they lick their lips and they will transmit the infection to the corners of the mouth. Okay, so the thought here in terms of treatment, depending on their level of immune suppression. If it's the first time and they're immune competent, you might consider a topical, say clotrimazole, 10 milligram troches, QID, and always, in addition, put some topical ointment in the corners of the mouth, whatever is your favorite topical antifungal ointment but it truly takes both. Direct application in the corners of the mouth and something um, for the tongue and the oral mucosa. If someone is more immune compromised and it's recurrent and recalcitrant, that's when you might want to consider the fluconazole. Um, depending on your practice, you have to gauge uh, what's most effective for that particular uh, patient. And you can see here it took three weeks to actually clear up our angular chylitis here. Now then, when we see this degree of, this is the pseudomembranous candidiasis. Remember the white kind, the curdy kind that wipes off? Again, same complaint, gums burn, food tastes lousy, cold water and ice cream are not comfortable. This again would be pseudomembranous candidiasis uh, that we would treat accordingly. But their other complaint is what? Sensitivity to cold water on the teeth. And if you look very closely on the right hand side, the sensitivity to cold fluids is not directly related to a candidiasis infection. See the recession on the gums on the gingiva here? Gingiva and bone should be up here. I hope you can see where I'm pointing with my pointer, right here. This is where the bone should be. And when you have recession, Ooh, can I take this? Thank you, whoever put that up there. Okay, recession here, here, and here, and certainly here. And also it's sensitive to hot and cold because we see beginnings of tooth decay. See this dark brown? We may start to see uh, root decay here. So you can treat the candidiasis, send them to the dentist for treatment for the periodontal status and their restoration. Okay, again, why do I have these here? We know it's pseudomembranous candidiasis. When you have someone with recalcitrant, whether they're immune suppressed or immune competent, ask if they have asthma and ask if they're using a steroid inhaler. A lot of folks forget that when they use a steroid inhaler, because steroids will promote the growth of candidiasis, 
After the use of that inhaler, they need to swish their mouth with water and spit out any excess steroid. And that'll help prevent this condition that we're seeing right here. Now then on the right side, we can certainly see more advanced candidiasis. This is what? You probably all recognize this as oral pharyngeal candidiasis. This is someone who is more immune suppressed. Uh, this would require certainly more than topical therapy, systemic therapy. Uh, and what uh, I've included here is a study that was done quite recently, 2010, uh, in Triple O, or Quad O, uh, an excellent oral journal. And they did a study on 122 patients um, with HIV who were on a stable art therapy, and they found that 80% of those folks had yeast colonization. Now, they weren't all symptomatic. About a third of this 80% were symptomatic, but 20, here's the, the interesting part, 25% had resistant strains to fluconazole, and we're seeing more of that lately. If it's resistant, you may want to do a culture and sensitivity if you have a recalcitrant uh, situation, if fluconazole doesn't work. Uh, sometimes uh, itraconazole works, but oftentimes not. Sometimes uh, they have to go to more stronger IV medications. It just depends what else is going on with the patient, but this is serious. Okay, now then, if we see a patient with um, candidiasis, here we have more pseudomembranous that wipes off. You have a red base, which may bleed, actually, when you wipe this off. This person has a denture. And if we don't treat their denture, which is also infected with candidiasis, we are going to probably prolong this infection and have a very difficult time uh, eradicating it. So you've got to give your patient information to tell them they have to treat their denture, or if they have a removal partial, they have to treat the partial. If they have a splint, TMJ splint, that's going to be infected. Uh, they have to treat those appliances as well. They can use chlorhexidine or nystatin oral suspension, um, and they can get that information also from their dentist, but anyone can say, hey, if you have a denture, make sure you treat your denture and also remind them to get a new toothbrush. That's something that can be done in any medical office, um, and it goes a long way towards helping the patient. Okay, This is simply uh, one of those guard appliances that uh, would need to be treated as well. Okay, now we're moving on to, again, a more serious situation. We have a 27-year-old male with AIDS diagnosis two years ago, CD4 of 19, viral load, pretty high, poorly controlled diabetic, uh, crits only 33%. What we're seeing on the soft palate and uvula here is what we call hyperplastic candidiasis because it cannot be wiped away. This candidiasis is growing well into the epithelial layers. It uh, definitely takes uh, a higher level of systemic therapy. You can see they're extremely immune suppressed. Um, this patient was actually hospitalized after I saw them. They were not doing well. They needed to be uh, have their glycemic levels controlled, and uh, they actually did a viral resistance. Got him back on track, but it, uh, it took a little bit. And looking at the patient, what was surprising, they didn't complain of that much pain, they didn't look that sick, but they clearly were. So you can tell a lot from the oral manifestations. The two main oral concerns in dentistry in general are both bacterial infections, dental decay, is bacterial, strep mutans is the primary etiologic agent, and for periodontal disease, it is also a bacterial disease. And there's, you know, at least 60 different bacteria that can cause periodontal disease. So the disease progression, interestingly enough, in periodontal disease is dependent on the host defenses. Whether that be someone who's immune suppressed or not immune suppressed, their immune status does, to some degree, to a large degree, sometimes impact how severe their periodontal disease is. So let's look at the two main types that we see. The minor, what we call linear gingival erythema. It's interesting, it looks like someone, where's my green arrow, painted almost a line at the bottom of the teeth, right where the teeth and the gums, the gingiva, meet. That's why we call it linear gingival erythema. There's a nice red line right there. Mild pain doesn't disrupt any activity. 
Uh, it's just very annoying and, and sometimes painful. Um, and I'm often asked, how do you tell this from regular periodontal disease? And that's an excellent question. It responds poorly to conventional treatment. When the dental hygienist does a scaling and root planing, this red line may not go away and the discomfort may not go away. And when it persists, then you have to ask yourself, is this periodontal disease or is this something else um, going on with the patient? Now, we're seeing it progress. See? We're starting to get some dehiscence. This may slough. And this is we're transitioning into a more necrotic situation. This is still linear gingival erythema, but it's getting a little worse. Sometimes it'll stay plateaued. Sometimes it'll progress, again, depending on the immune status of your host. Treatment, chlorhexidine um, debridement, 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate, swish and spit twice a day, brush and floss, um, gentle flossing and brush at least two to three times a day. And I have topical antifungal here because they have found a lot of times in these lesions they will be co-infected with yeast. So sometimes it's prudent if the chlorhexidine by itself is not adequate, you may want to put in a, a topical therapy, maybe code trimazole for a week or two and see if that will help resolve it. Um, I wanted to share this one picture on the bottom. You can see again the linear gingival erythema. See the enlargement? This is not due to candidiasis. This is due to dilantin hyperplasia, this fibrotic gingiva. It just looks a little more advanced because it's fibrotic. It's kind of interesting. I wanted to share it with you. Again, this is a uh, prescription medication available in any pharmacy. Remind your patient when they use this. I like them to use it in the morning and before they go to bed at night. Nothing to eat or drink for 30 minutes and dose one hour from a fluoride treatment. A lot of our patients uh, will be on fluoride therapy because of their high dental decay susceptibility. So if they use both of these, and a lot of our patients will be on both of these, dose them at least one hour apart, or one is not going to work, usually the Peridex. Okay. Now, just to give you, uh, again, transitioning into a little more advanced periodontal disease, 24-year-old college student with painful gum disease, one week duration, sudden onset. Bad breath is a hallmark sign of any periodontal condition. I'm sure you can all attest to that when you walk into the room and ask the patient to open their mouth. Sometimes it's not very pleasant. Um, painful to eat, gingival bleeding. But you can see what's um, important here. See the fact that this papillae back here is nice and sharp and goes up between the teeth here. It's blunted. And that white is just a little bit of purulence and it's inflamed. And it doesn't adhere real well to the bone and to the teeth. This would be acute ulcerative gingivitis. The treatment would be very much the same as before. Chlorhexidine, um, brush and floss, debridement, get some sleep, and get a decent diet. Sometimes um, I'll recommend the patients use Insure or Boost. Helps a lot because if they don't feel like eating, at least they get some adequate nutrition. Moving on to much more severe periodontal disease. We have a 24-year-old female. She actually came in to a clinic complaining of oral pain, inability to eat. For two weeks, she had lost weight. This is a hallmark sign where she wakes up with blood on the pillow. She said she needs some help. Reviewed the medical history. It was uh, significant for gastroesophageal reflux. No identified risk factors for HIV. Um, but when I looked at her mouth, it was very clear to me something serious was going on. This is not normal. This is a hallmark of necrotizing periodontitis where the gingival tissue and the bone, supporting bone, resolves or recedes very quickly. The endotoxins produced by these bacteria uh, will cause very quick attachment loss of the gingiva and bone loss causing these teeth to be very loose. And you'll see some purulence right around here. And of course, what we had to do for this uh, lady uh, was put her on systemic antibiotics. 
uh, and she was in so much pain um, for two or three days. I actually had to use some uh, opioid for two days, and then eventually, after a couple weeks, we got the gingiva stable and had to unfortunately remove some of the teeth because with that much bone loss, they cannot be restored. Antibiotics for this condition could be metronidazole or clindamycin. You need something that's somewhat broad. We need to uh, focus on the gram positive, but essentially the gram negative organisms in this condition. And it uh, can also be a sign of immune suppression. I realized when this whole situation was over and she had some confidence in me, that's when she revealed that she was an injection drug user. She didn't do that first off. Now then, we finished the fungal, we finished periodontal disease for now. I want to move on to viral infections that we might see. Uh, Harry leukoplakia herpes and HPV. I'm looking for questions. Okay, we're doing good. We used to see this very frequently uh, since the era of art. Hardly ever see this unless someone is having severe immune suppression. And remember, this actually can appear um, in someone who's immune suppressed, say, that has an organ transplant. It's uh, very unusual to see it in that situation, but we can. Oral hairy leukoplasia, very characteristic, vertical, um, white lesions, lateral tongue usually, can be inside the buccal mucosa or inside the cheeks does not wipe off, is not painful. And if you do a classic biopsy, you'll see, again, the hyperkeratosis, which is the whiteness, bloom cells, the acanthosis. And to confirm the diagnosis, um, especially in someone that reports no risk factors yet for HIV, uh, and even in our lab, we would do it anyway, is the definitive test, which is an Epstein-Barr virus DNA and cytohybridization. What this does is probe the Epstein-Barr virus, which is proliferating in the upper part of the epithelium. That's what these little deep red dots are right here. This is Epstein-Barr virus uh, reacting positively to the DNA and cytohybridization test. Okay, so that's your gold standard for that particular diagnosis. It doesn't always look like textbooks. Okay, oral hairy leukoplakia doesn't always uh, look like the nice, discrete vertical striations. This was a case of oral hairy leukoplakia that was initially uh, diagnosed as lichen planus. He had a 34-year-old male. He came in because this was unsightly. This was actually very thready, feathery growth, which he cut off uh, with a little scissors from the side of his tongue. Um, and when we looked at it, to me, it certainly did not look like lichen planus, and after we did the biopsy, we realized it was oral hairy leukoplakia. Just to share with you, it can have different appearances. Now, again, uh, this by itself could look like oral hairy leukoplakia. But the point I'd like to make here is take a good look. What we see here, the entire lesion is this. Okay, we have red-white mixed lesions. Anytime on the lateral border of the tongue you see a red and white mixed lesion, be concerned. Okay, be concerned. If you don't know for sure a reason or a cause, that's when we need to biopsy. We had a 58-year-old male or female, asymptomatic, lateral ventral tongue, two years duration. It really didn't bother her. Uh, viral lobe is not detectable. She was a smoker, also alcohol and again, colon cancer 12 years ago, which really has no direct impact on this. That was just part of her history. And when we did the biopsy, this was not OHL, it was dysplasia, okay? That was carcinoma. And again, the red and white mixed lesion, this is all infected, okay? Another thing when you're looking at these, you need to, as I've done here, pull the tongue out with your hands, piece of gauze, gloved, of course, hands and gauze, um, and pull 
pretty far to the side. So you can see way back, uh, if you can see the circumvallic papillae, that would be great. And then run your finger right along the side. Sometimes uh, dysplasia, cancer, will start to feel firm. may not look involved, but when you start to feel the firmness under the mucosa, you need to be uh, a little more vigilant. You need to be concerned that that might be something serious. Okay, now I'd like to switch gears, talk about something we see commonly. Herpes simplex virus is, is a common uh, finding in anyone, everyone. But in HIV-infected folks, it usually is a little more recalcitrant to treatment. So what we have on the left is what you might see classically. Uh, you get recurrent herpes vesicles, like we see here on the palate, sometimes after trauma to the mouth, frequently after dental treatment. Someone who has a history of HSV will break out with these multiple ulcers. And this is uh, a pretty classic example. Multiple. It starts off as very small, one to two millimeter vesicles, fluid-filled vesicles. Usually by the time the individual gets to a healthcare professional, the vesicles have ruptured and we see multiple small ulcers. Okay, and that can happen in a matter of one to two days. Then, sometimes you can see them a few days after, in this case, this lady had unprotected recent sex with a new partner. The little vesicles had ruptured and become one confluent ulcer you see in the hard palate. And I'll tell you, this is very, very painful. But you can tell it's HSV because back here, you can still see remnants of what was small multiple vesicles. Um, Salcyclovir would be appropriate in this case. What's interesting in HIV infection HSV reactivation can look like primary herpes. Uh, recurrent herpes that we saw in the previous slide happens on tissue that's over bone, usually gingiva or hard palate. In HIV infected individuals, the reactivation can again look like primary herpes where we see little vesicles on unbound tissue, it can be on the tongue or the lips, multiple vesicles that are ruptured. So don't think it has to be limited to the gingiva or the hard palate. It can be anywhere. Now, this was a very interesting case that I want to show, share with you because initially part of the diagnosis eluded the practitioners. We have a 24-year-old injection drug user, diagnosis two years ago. History, she had a history of chronic oral candidiasis. And when she presented, uh, to the clinician, she had this lesion for two weeks. It was assumed to be um, candidiasis because of her history, because it was a, the commissure area. She was put on antifungal therapy, and she talked to one of her friends, and one of her friends told her that Listerine was also good for this condition as well. So when we saw her, this is what the condition appeared. She had used uh, straight Listerine four to five times a day and it caused necrosis of her lips. Uh, too much Listerine is a bad thing. Uh, now we would recommend any mouthwash be alcohol free, which is uh, Listerine has both alcohol free and alcohol containing products, but we now recommend everything to be alcohol free for a mouth rinse. And you can see the lesion had dried up, but it was still present. So. We looked back at her initial presentation photos, and you can see here a little vesicle and another little vesicle here. And we realized when we did a uh, PAP smear here that she was co-infected with HSV and candidiasis. And then four weeks after combined therapy, she actually did heal with a little bit of scarring that was left. Again, just sometimes we have to take a second look. Now, switching gears a little bit to a different viral entity. 26-year-old male presented to an emergency clinic, severe oral pain. We can see vesicles and crusted ulcers on this side of the mouth. Some are vesicles, some are already scabbed and crusted. He had dizziness, vertigo, painful external ear, and some weight loss. 
the key here, as you know, is the fact that these lesions stopped right at the midline. That's a very important factor. Okay, this is V3 stopped at the midline, vesicles, ulcers, and the inner ear had a little bit of vesicles, not the inner, the external ear had some vesicles, uh, cranial nerve 7 was infected. And yes, you are correct, this is varicella zoster shingles, and again, the classic sign is it goes to the midline and stops. He actually was starting into what they call Ramsey Hunt syndrome, the ear involvement and the dizziness. So when I saw him in the clinic, my first response was to tell him what it looked like he had, but because of the ear involvement, we referred him to a ear, nose, and throat specialist for an additional workup. And found out after the fact that he was HIV positive. And again, he didn't divulge that at the onset. So let's move into human papillomavirus. There's a lot in the literature right now about HPV. Not much about what's going on in the mouth. It more re refers to uh, cervical cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer. As you know, there are probably 100 types of uh, human papillomaviruses out there, quite a few. We'll say at least 40, at least 40 types and there are several that occur in the mouth. And they can appear in various situations. They usually appear papillary corrugated like this at the tongue short. This is one in the ventral floor of the mouth, the ventral tongue. And this is the cauliflower type on the gingiva. All of these are human papillomaviruses and they have a variety of appearances. Oftentimes it is as we know, the site of uh, sexual contact, oral sex, will certainly promote these. Treatment is very difficult. Here we have an example of prolific uh, human papillomavirus. And of course, that is why this patient came in. It was the unsightliness, not the pain. Um, just This was very unesthetic, and he wanted these removed. Again, for intraoral, there's not a real satisfactory way to treat these. They can do cryo, they can do laser. The medicaments that can be used on the external skin are controversial regarding whether we should be using them in the mouth. Usually what happens is these are removed either with laser or general surgery, and unfortunately they have a very, very high recurrence rate um, because the patients usually do not change their sexual habits. So they uh, continue and then this recurs. These are generally, these and the ones in the previous slide, when you type them, they are low risk HPV. 6, 11 are the two most common types versus the high risk HPV 16, which is more associated with uh, carcinoma. Sometimes these will respond spontaneously. Sometimes if they start, heart, it will help. Um, sometimes there uh, is believed immune reconstitution promotes these, but usually this is a, an educational situation. Once you eradicate them, then you need to educate the patient what uh, things they need to do to avoid being reinfected. These are difficult. These are difficult to deal with. Now, I want to move into ulcers. Aptus ulcers in this group, you may see them on the tongue, the vocal mucosa, Again, they are just a little more painful, a little harder to treat than someone who's immune competent. Okay, classic pseudomembranous coloring, maybe yellow with a, a red halo. And these are easy to distinguish from HSV or herpes because there's usually, they're usually larger. They are separate. There's one or two or three spaced out, not the very small vesicles. And usually the patient has a history of canker sores. Now, when we see major aptus ulcers. This is where we really get concerned. If they don't respond to our usual therapy after two to three weeks, then it's time to biopsy them because a chronic non-healing ulcer can be uh, dysplasia or squamous cell. These are very, very painful. The treatments are usually topical steroids or systemic steroids initially. Again, if they don't respond, we need 
to do a biopsy. Here's an individual, 31-year-old. He was on medications and he was compliant, but he did get recurrent abdus ulcers. We have one here, and also this is one that just healed. See, a little crater treatment, depending on the severity, the pain, and the size, you have to tailor your treatment to match the patient's needs. Topical steroids could be fluocinonide, clobazole. We can compound it with orobase and help it stick. You can do dexamethasone elixir rinses if the mouth has quite a few lesions. And of course, uh, systemic steroid for major lesions. And any time we put patients on topical corticosteroids or systemic, uh, I will often uh, include a therapy of an antifungal because, as we know, steroids will promote uh, candidiasis. And candidiasis is oftentimes uh, a concern in these patients by itself. So I try and prevent that from happening. Repetitive. Um, you could prescribe a little bit of 2% viscous silicane to dab on ulcers. Please, the reason I put it in here, be wary of giving a patient a rinse with 2% viscous lidocaine because if they gargle with it, your gag reflex is lost. They could aspirate food. Certainly, I don't give this to children at all because I don't want them to aspirate food. It's just a little FYI. Okay. Here's an interesting chronic ulcer, which is why we say if they don't respond, you need to biopsy them. This patient came in with this area believed to be an infection from an extraction that they didn't uh, remove the tooth in its entirety and caused an infection. The patient did not respond to antibiotics. In fact, when they came back, they were worse. So we did a, and a biopsy, additional biopsy, got more tissue, did the fungal stains that you see uh, when you have a non-healing ulcer, you have to be concerned about dysplasia or fungal infection. And we found in this case, he had a silver stain, which was positive for histoplasmosis. Okay, see these little black circles? That's a positive stain for histoplasmosis. So when things don't respond to uh, the usual care, do the next step. And usually in the mouth, it would be a biopsy. Okay, in the next few minutes, let's talk about malignancies. The most common one, we all know, is Kaffir's juice sarcoma. Now we're seeing, again, since art, at least in this country, we're seeing much less of that. In Africa, that's a different situation. But in the U.S., uh, especially in areas where patients uh, can access therapy, we don't see this very much. And when we do, it is an indication, as we said earlier, something's amiss, something's gone awry. This patient was referred to me by a dermatologist. He wanted to know if the lesion on the leg had anything to do with what was going on in the mouth. And we immediately recognized, yes, there was definitely a correlation. that We did the biopsy, and this proved to be Kaffir's juice sarcoma. Okay. Diagnosis, this one was pretty far advanced, but it was amazing how much these two looked alike. Uh, it had already become bulbous diffuse, the blue-black rather than the earlier red-purple lesion, which I'll show you momentarily. But the key thing here is to remember the mouth can be the initial site for this condition. Primary sites are the palate and the gingiva. Depending on who you read, it's the initial site in 20 to 70 percent of the cases, which simply means a lot of variability in those studies. Um, but I, you know, reinforce to everyone, if you see this, you need to actually have the patient totally checked out because this could be in the lungs, the eyes, the brain could be anywhere. And I think all of us know this is human herpes virus 8. Other pictures. This is probably what, an early one I've seen. It looked like, again, a burn. It was flat. The patient knew it was there. That's why they came in. It was one of my long-term patients. Is it progressive? You can see it becomes a little more bulbous. Sometimes it doesn't really hurt that much, and they only know it's there. Like in this one, if they eat something that traumatizes it and it bleeds. And here is probably the smallest lesion I've ever seen. There between the lateral and the central incisor. That did not bring the patient into our clinic. He came in because he had some white HPV lesions on the lips that he wanted removed. And when I did the exam, I saw this. Okay. And that was 
the beginning of cabbage juice on the gingiva. Again, biopsy. And just to kind of show you how this progresses, in the mouth, this can progress relatively quickly. These two are probably four weeks apart, four to six. And you can see these become more bulbous. They become more diffuse. The red turns to purple, and it becomes more bulbous. And this happened to be a patient of ours with a skin lesion. Again, it can certainly appear on, on the skin as well. The white covering on this large, large lesion uh, was iatrogenic. The patient was embarrassed, so they were wearing gloves, and the gloves had powder on the inside. So that's not a part of the lesion. It was the powder rubbing off on his skin lesion. Interesting case here. We have a 35-year-old male, immune suppressed, low CD4 count. He had lost weight. He had this chronic condition of the soft palate. Okay. This is the normal side of the soft palate on the left. The right side, you can see, is diffusely erythematous. We've lost the architecture in the soft palate arch. Our differential might include chronic aptus, a fungal infection. In that area, wild iris ring, you've certainly got to think of lymphoma, squamous cell carcinoma. After doing the biopsy, we found that this was squamous cell carcinoma, and this was HPV-16 positive. Back there, we typed it. Okay, this is um, HPV-induced squamous cell carcinoma on the soft palate. And as you know, the HPV-16 positive squamous cell carcinomas are doing better with treatment than the HPV-16 negative carcinomas. Okay, but this is what it would look like. And I think anyone would realize that's certainly not normal. That's something we would need to take care of quickly. Now, I think this is our last case. We have a 24-year-old HIV-positive male. Again, chronic ulcer, many months. Not really sure how many months. And sometimes when they tell you nine, it could have been much longer than that. Uh, sometimes these are painful, but sometimes they're not. And they, patients will tend to ignore them, thinking it's a traumatic lesion that will eventually heal. But when something doesn't heal or go away in two to three weeks, obviously you need to follow up on it. Okay, difficulty swallowing. He was not compliant with his meds. Again, differential diagnosis would be chronic irritation from a sharp tooth, which is what the patient might tell themselves if they uh, wanted to hope this was not something serious. Deep fungal infection, histo. If they have tuberculosis, uh, we can have tuberculosis lesions um, on the tongue or squamous cell carcinoma. And this one was HPV positive tongue squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. And this, again, if you had rubbed your finger along this border of the lesion, it's going to be firm. Okay, It's not going to feel like normal tissue. This will be soft and pliable. This will be firm and boardy in most situations. It gets to be very firm. Treatment on this would be, of course, in our case, we would send it. If I knew they were positive, I would let their physician know if they had a physician. Do the biopsy and we refer them here for a tumor board full workup. Okay. Sometimes if I suspect an issue, we would get the oncologist in uh, before the biopsy and do some imaging just to see how diffuse this is. And we would do the same thing on this one. Okay. If I sus suspect a lymphoma before we do a biopsy, we might do uh, an imaging just to see uh, how diffuse the lesion is because that's important. Dr. Stewart, you, you spoke about biopsy on uh, several occasions. Uh, that's not something that I've ever done. Uh, are there, uh, in referring to dentists, do we need to uh, check and be sure that they are ready and uh, willing to do a biopsy and or have a good oral pathologist to refer to, or what would you suggest we yeah, do? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. You usually develop teams when you're working with these, but when I say biopsy, if I think it's a local entity in the mouth, I refer to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I have, you know, four to five that I know will do the right workup and get the right site because getting the right biopsy site sometimes makes the difference between making a diagnosis and not. If I think it's beyond what an oral surgeon would uh, feel comfortable doing if it involves more of the ear, the parotid, 
uh, the neck, then I refer to an ear, nose, and throat surgeon for that. And for anything in the mouth, if you can send your specimens to an oral pathology laboratory, I think you would probably, at least definitely for oral lesions, uh, do the patient a good service because they're just a little more attuned to nuances in the oral cavity. Thanks for asking that question. Dr. Stewart, the other thing I heard you um, mention, and that was the idea of uh, empiric therapy and uh, observing the response to therapy, and clearly in certain cases where that uh, Res the expected response did not occur, you went farther, you went to next steps. Uh, one of the things I always wonder about is, do you go ahead and say to patients, uh, you know, this is empiric therapy, I really want to know this is going to be, is getting better, and if it's not, I want you to come back because I want to uh, consider other things, other treatments, and or uh, other testing. Yeah, good question. When I talk about empiric therapy, let's, let's take uh, candidiasis. If I suspect candidiasis, in my setting, I usually do a cytologic smear before I prescribe for a new patient. I can get the results back in two days. And then I put, you know, phone in the prescription, have them back in two weeks and see how they're doing. Uh, I could say the same for my aptus ulcer patients. If it's initial, uh, and it looks like aptus ulcer, and it's, you know, clinically has the history consistent with aptus ulcers, I can prescribe with comfort topical uh, corticosteroids, have them back in two to three weeks and see how they're doing. Uh, empirical therapy usually for me stops there until I get a biopsy, because I do like to know what I'm treating before I treat it. But a lot of folks will do empirical therapy for candidiasis, and that's okay as long as you follow up on it. Um, I know a, a cytologic smear is expensive and takes more time, and empirical therapy, two-week trial of antifungal, make sure you get the patient on the books to come back, and um, that would be acceptable. Yes, my, my concern was that loss to follow-up and, and the patient thinking, well, this didn't work, they didn't know what they were doing, and and not following up, and so I, I'm always a little leery of that issue. And in our clinic, when that happens, I usually have a little tick list. If the patient, we make a follow-up patient, uh, patient uh, appointment, if they don't show, they get a phone call. And sometimes I make those phone calls myself to let the patient know um, that I need to know how they're doing, and if they're not responding, I need to see them again. And that's, that's usually uh, effective in our, our clinic. Yep. But you, you are correct. absolutely 100% correct. Follow-up is critical. We can't just let them go out the door thinking they're cured. Unfortunately, that happens a lot on patients who have a toothache, and they'll come into an emergency clinic, get antibiotics for two weeks, calms the tooth down, and they think they're cured, uh, only to have it flare up sometimes um, in a more serious uh, presentation two weeks, two months, six months later. So what you mentioned is, is very valid. When it comes to HIV care, oral health care, there's primarily three things that we deal with. The first one is oral lesions, which we talked about in part two. The other two are the dental part, the tooth part, and the gingival part. And this is the part I want to focus on today and give you an overview of what you might see and how you can respond to that in the medical office and sometimes initiate care before we go to the dental office. So the other two components are tooth decay, dental caries, um, which primarily, as you all know, these are bacterial infections. Uh, Streptococcus mutans is the primary bacterial organism that causes tooth decay. And in most cases, it's preventable or at least we can mitigate it through oral hygiene. Inadequate oral hygiene is one of the main reasons for tooth decay, as you all know. And salivary changes. 
salivary changes in HIV infected patients happen subtly and they happen early in the disease. And the saliva is usually less in the amount and the proteins change so that the saliva is less, less effective in dealing with uh, strep mutans and preventing tooth decay. We'll talk about that a little more as we go through this. Of course, medications can impact uh, saliva and impact the oral environment. And a big one is diet. Uh, high sugar intake will certainly make a difference. Now then, periodontal disease is also a bacterial um, disease. Lots of gram negative and some gram positive uh, bacteria will contribute to periodontal disease. We also know that tobacco smoking uh, is not good for the gingiva, the periodontum, uh, the supporting structures, and diabetes and the immune status all figure into periodontal disease. And the the significance and the severity of periodontal disease is very much a host defense issue. How is the immune status in uh, the individual? So, not that I want to make dentists of you, but I think just a little bit of terminology and some background about teeth might be helpful. Um, this is the universal, most commonly used numbering system for the adult dentition, it's different for pediatrics, but this is the adult dentition. As you can see, there are 32 teeth, which was one of your questions. And the third molars are also called wisdom teeth. Commonly, folks will say my wisdom teeth hurt. Wisdom teeth are, oops, let me get the green arrow for you. Tooth number one, number 16, number 17, and number 32. And in numbering teeth, we start on the right, and we go right to left, and left to right. So it's 1 to 16 and 17 to 32. And if, a little more on terminology. The front teeth are called incisors because you incise with them and bite. Uh, then we have the bicuspids, and the back three teeth are the molars, which do most of the chewing. Okay, so with that as background, let's move on and define what we're going to be using as our triage scheme. For a routine, if you see something that needs a routine referral, we usually consider that a uh, routine referral from the medical office to the dental office, two to four weeks or next available. In other words, not urgent, but it needs to be seen. Um, urgent, we consider that two to three days. It's something that's not same day, not that it needs to go to the emergency room right away, but it's urgent. It needs to be seen in the next two or three days. So when you refer to the dental office, you would say urgent, two to three days. So those are the three groups we're going to be talking about. And I'll try and help as we go through our next 10 cases, categorize what you're seeing into a routine referral, an urgent referral, or an emergency referral. Consider a routine referral. Let's focus first on the teeth, and then we'll talk about the gingiva or the periodontal gum tissue. The patient tells you that they've had bothersome uh, teeth for several days, weeks, or sometimes months. Um, the discomfort's mild. It doesn't interrupt their daily routine. And an occasional Tylenol or aspirin takes care of the pain. So far, that's pretty much a routine referral. It needs treatment, but it doesn't have to be done ASAP. Now let's look at the pain. For a routine referral, we're hoping the pain is not spontaneous. It may begin after, you know, a sugary meal or a candy bar, uh, ice cream, cold fluids, but the pain or the uh, let's call it sensitivity from cold, does not persist. It goes away in two or three seconds. Okay, so that would be a toothache that is chronic, comes and goes, not spontaneous pain, and does not disrupt the routine. That would be considered a routine referral. Now then, let's look at the gingiva. A lot of your patients are going to have plaque and calculus, or commonly called tartar. That, with a little bit of gingival inflammation, uh, unfortunately, is pretty common. You're going to see that frequently. What about pain? 
uh, mild pain or discomfort, it's probably going to be a routine referral. Let's move on to an urgent referral. For the teeth, the pain is more severe. Okay, it's disruptive to their daily routine. Pain is constant, it's sharp, it's spontaneous. It occurs without provocation. Not hot sensitive, not cold sensitive, it just comes on its own. It can be localized to one or two teeth. Now then, if you tap or touch the tooth, it will be tender. And if you're going to do that, I suggest that you advise and kind of warn the patient ahead of time. Don't just tap on a tooth that's sore because they're going to jump and they might close suddenly on your finger and that's never uh, something we want to have happen. So if you're going to tap on teeth, let the patient know that. But this, is called, this would be consistent with a urgent referral. Sharp pain, disruptive pain, spontaneous, comes on its own. And pain like this is oftentimes into the uh, nerve of the tooth. So let's talk about urgent referral for the gingiva. This is spontaneous bleeding of the gums. Um, severely altered gingival contour or architecture, and I'm going to show you some um, pictures of that. Certainly fever, infection, or purulence is something that we want to look at pretty quickly. Now then, what do we consider emergency? or ASAP, same day. First off, anytime the airway is compromised, the patient comes in, I can't breathe easily, uh, you notice that their voice sounds a little high, perhaps, wheezy. This is a serious issue. So we have a compromised airway. Anytime you have dental infection or face infection that's spreading rapidly, that gets our attention. That needs urgent care, especially if it's compromising the airway, or if the infection is approaching the eye. That is serious. Eye goes to the brain um, pretty quickly if it's not managed. Fever, lymphadenopathy, weight loss, extreme fatigue. If someone's just really, really fatigued, um, they're weak. They can hardly make it into your office. They're febrile, pulse in uh, blood pressure are either high or thready, uh, that is a serious issue, and I'm going to show you an oral case of that as well. And of course, anytime there's spontaneous intraoral hemorrhage, uh, which can happen in our HIV-positive individuals if their coag factors are off or for a lot of other reasons. And I'll show you one of those examples who just walked in and uh, had spontaneous hemorrhage. Okay, case one. We're going to start from easy to more difficult. Case one, 24-year-old female presents to the medical office for routine follow-up. She has non-detectable viral load and a CD4 count of 550. Chief concern, she mentions, she also has sore gums for two months. You are now comfortable with looking at the mouth, hopefully a little more. What you should look for when you're looking at gingival tissue. Hers is actually, it looks pretty good. You see the knife edge flat gingiva here and here. So what we also notice is where the arrows are. We have a little inflammation here, a little inflammation here, here, a little back here, a little back here. That's what's causing her soreness, is, are those little inflamed areas. We also have a fractured tooth, which we'll talk about momentarily. That is not her chief concern, and it's really not painful. So what did we find? Gingival inflammation started a week ago. You get more history, and one of the first things to ask any patient, have you had any new rinses or toothpaste? What we have found out is the gingiva is very sensitive in some of our patients to irritation from tartar control toothpaste, hypersensitivity to certain agents in toothpaste. If they started a new toothpaste, which was the case in this young lady, uh, the Pain in her gingiva started about five days after a new toothpaste. That was what was causing her, causing her uh, discomfort. She had a hypersensitivity to some of the abrasive agents in the toothpaste. Office management in this one is pretty easy once you find out the etiology. You want to recommend a fluoride toothpaste, but one with no abrasives, not a lot of tartar control, hopefully not whiteners if there's some gingival issues. Uh, and that would be a routine referral then to the dentist. 
Okay, pretty straightforward. You just have to ask some of the right questions. So her gingival sensitivity was not from periodontal disease. It was from a hypersensitivity to some of the agents uh, that she was using. In this case, it was tartar controlled toothpaste. Now then, let's go back. Remember we had a large fractured tooth? That had asked how, how long has it been there? Is it painful? Been there, you know, two years, it's not painful. In this case, it does need to be repaired, but it's not urgent. Okay, fractured teeth, as they age, the pulp will sometimes shrink down and it will kind of insulate itself so it's not as tender or sensitive to hot colds or sweep. So that was a pretty mon minimal, uh, easy case. Now let's move on to case number two. You can see this picture is a little more involved. We have a 42-year-old male presents again for a regular follow-up in the medical office. And also, as you're talking to them, you ask them how their mouth is. And they say, my gums hurt, I've got bad breath, I've got a nasty taste, and my mouth is dry. Now, as we've already mentioned, mouth dryness is not uncommon due to do the salivary and salivary gland changes in HIV disease and the medications they are on, both for HIV and in some cases for their other medical concerns, uh, diuretics, cardiovascular meds, or certainly antidepressants, all make the mouth drier. Sometimes that's not real unusual. Bad breath and nasty taste will come with dry mouth sometimes. It can also be, in this case, probably from their periodontal status. What we're seeing here is gingival pain. It's diffuse, intermittent, comes and goes for the past five months. But we definitely see some gingival changes. We see erythema around the tissue. We see plaque and calculus where the white arrows are. Now obviously probably haven't had a debridement for a while. We see also some plaque up here, some here, and some caries. And oftentimes patients will have what we call this gold window crown where the gold is put on top of the tooth with mineral prep. It doesn't fit real well and it will oftentimes cause gingival inflammation. The other thing to consider when they have a uh, nasty taste, bad breath, of course, would be candidiasis on top of their periodontal uh, issues. So what do we do? We have chronic plaque induced gingivitis. Medical office management considerations. I think you're all familiar with 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate rinse. Brand names would be Peridex, uh, Periogard. You know, right, this is a prescription item and it's on most all of the uh, formularies for Ryan White, ADAP, and so forth. Switch with half an ounce, 30 seconds, spit it out, do that morning and night, and don't rinse for, or don't rinse, eat, or drink for 30 minutes. Now this is, chlorhexidine gluconate is a great antibacterial rinse. And as we know, periodontal disease is uh, bacterial induced. So this will help decrease the inflammation, decrease the infection, and certainly buy a little time before they can get to the dental office. So they can't get to the dentist for another two to four weeks. This will help a little bit. The other thing I want to make sure you realize is we have now this chlorhexidine rinse that's alcohol-free. Alcohol-free is actually better because the alcohol won't uh, cause any burning or desiccation of the buccal mucosa. As you know, alcohol is not good for the inside of the mouth because it does cause some desiccation. But sometimes alcohol-containing products are to be avoided. Um, if there's some alcohol abuse issues, uh, we may want to go with the alcohol-free chlorhexidine gluconate. Then try and encourage the patient to brush, and hopefully in your medical offices you have some oral hygiene pamphlets that talk about brushing, flossing, nutrition. Hand those out. And your referral here would be next available. We talked just a little bit about the importance of dryness. There are some over-the-counter rinses you can also use to educate your patient, make them feel better. What I'd like you to focus on make sure they're sugar-free. And the best sweetener out there is xylitol. Xylitol is somewhat of a, a natural sweetener that does not promote dental decay. In fact, now we think it may even help reduce dental decay. This is the 
uh, sweetener actually that's put in rinses and gums for the military that are over in Afghanistan or places where they can't brush. Now, for want a rinse, again, sugar-free, alcohol-free, hopefully something soothing. Uh, some of the rinses, like biotin, you see a lot now on the uh, ads on TV. It does contain some nice antibacterial rinses to actually help uh, cleanse and make the mouth feel better. Also, if you're going to use or recommend sugar-free gum or lozenges, again, please try and encourage the patient to get xylitol sweetened um, lozenges or gum. There's a whole lot of them on the market. The gums, you know, Trident, Dentine, they all make sugar-free xylitol sweetened products now because everyone understands they are better than the, you know, aspartamine, sorbitol, some of those other products that are a little older. Do note, xylitol is toxic to dogs. So remind your patients to keep it out of out of any place where the dogs might nose it and grab some of it. Okay, we're going to go on to case three now. You have a 55-year-old male who presents with chief concern of a gum bump, bump on my gum, four to five duration. It was uh, spontaneous and acute, but then when the bump developed, the pain um, lessened just a little bit. So when we look in the mouth, again, this is our molar, has a large cavity in here. And we see on the gingiva a little bump called a gum boil or a parulus. This is associated with a chronic abscess in this molar. And what's happened is we have decay that's gone into the tooth, into the pulp, into the nerve, through the, there's two roots on this tooth, here and here. Oops. Here we go. Two roots. Here and here. And when there's infection at the root of the tooth, sometimes the infection will build up and tunnel out through the bone to the soft tissue. And it'll make a little swelling. That's what we have focused right here. And you can see these in anyone. So, treatment. When the decay is into the nerve of the root or nerve of the tooth and has uh, caused an abscess, there's only two treatments. Root canal or take the tooth out. Otherwise, it will become a chronic abscess, a chronic infection. It'll just persist. So what's happening, as we mentioned, the purulence creates a tract through the bone and is deposited beneath the soft tissue on the gingiva. Treatment can be as simple as warm salt water rinses. Hold it in your mouth for 30 seconds or a minute and spit. If there's swelling uh, or lymphadenopathy, for fever, you may want to consider antibiotics. The bottom line is this really needs to go to a dentist, hopefully within a week. Because what happens here, frequently happens, sometimes a physician or a dentist will put the patient on antibiotics. The swelling goes down, the pain goes away, and the patient mistakenly thinks they're cured. And all we've done is put off uh, make the infection less obvious, buy some time before they can get to the dentist. And if they think they're cured and do nothing, unfortunately, it'll puff back up again and it'll uh, become a recurrent problem. So again, this is where medical office can uh, provide some very valuable patient education. Even if the pain and swelling go away, they still need to see the dentist. And if this comes back worse, then they need to come back to you or an emergency dental clinic wherever they can. But again, we either need to do a root canal or extract the tooth. Once the decay has caused an abscess, uh, there's no way to just do a filling. Another patient education part real quick here. It used to be uh, thought good treatment to put a warm compress on the side of the face if you have an abscess. Now we uh, know and we're getting much better at letting other folks know that's not a good thing. In fact, it's uh, something you want to avoid. What happens when you put a hot compress and you pull the infection to the outside into the skin? The drainage when it heals will leave a very unesthetic scar. That's what we have right here. So warm compresses on the face are, are certainly something to be avoided. Again, drainage in the mouth, warm salt water rinses. 
Okay, let's move on to another case. Tooth decay. Again, a patient education thing. Three things to would cause tooth decay. The strep mutans bacteria that we talked about, a tooth, and the dietary carbs. But it takes all three of those, and when they come together, we get tooth decay. What do we do about it? What will modify this process? Saliva we've talked about. It's somewhat impaired, but we need to promote it. Oral hygiene and fluoride. Fluoride is the one thing that will strengthen the tooth, make it less susceptible to tooth decay. It's an easy thing to prescribe. Even if you just do an over-the-counter act alcohol-free, that's a step in the right direction. We'll talk about prescription fluorides momentarily, but this is uh, something that I would like to encourage everyone to remember. It's a small thing, but it long-term can be very, very important for the patient in terms of avoiding the, the root canals and the extraction. Now then, they've actually done studies, and this one was published in September 2012 in the Journal of Dental Research, uh, one of the better dental journals. And they did a nice study talking about strep mutans is it more prevalent in HIV-infected individuals? And what their study showed is compared with non-HIV-infected individuals and HIV-infected individuals, they validated what we've already talked about and what we already know. Saliva secretion was less in those who were HIV-infected, and they had a higher level of decayed surfaces. And what they had was a higher level of strep mutants. Regardless of their CD4 count or viral load or their heart, it seems that this group had uh, a higher level of strep mutant. So this just gives us a little objective data to back up what we're uh, promoting in terms of oral health. Fluoride, 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 fluoride. Um, lots of ways we can help the patient uh, and provide fluoride. One, as we mentioned, is OTC rinse. But oftentimes, because of the saliva and the medications, they need something stronger. Prescription fluoride options would include brush-on fl fluoride uh, gel. Uh, usually, we uh, prefer a 1.1% sodium fluoride because it's kinder to composite restorations, it's kinder to porcelain. And they would, in this particular case, use it at night. After regular brushing, just apply a thin layer to the teeth. This is a script item. Uh, one of the most commonly used products is Prevident. Uh, or you can get Prevident 500 Plus, the fluoride gel with toothpaste in one product. So all they do before they go to bed is brush once, they get their toothbrush uh, done and their fluoride treatment at the same time. And this is very good for patient compliance. The third way is the kind of fluoride we do for folks that have had radiation therapy who have absolutely no saliva for various reasons, not just radiation therapy. And you just, this would take a dental office to make a fluoride custom tray and put that, uh, put the fluoride in here, and then they would wear it five minutes in the evening. But in a medical office, I would strongly suggest probably we do one of these, fluoride gel with the toothpaste. And the Prevident 5000 Boost uh, for dry mouth, the script item works very well and has pretty good patient compliance. Now then, let's move on to some other cases. Case four, we have a 19-year-old male, CD4-380, viral load non-detectable. He is compliant with his antiretroviral therapy. He has moderate pain in the lower right for one week. So you look in there, what do you see? This is they point to this as being the problem. You see a flap of tissue over the tooth. This is called um, a bacterial infection called pericornitis. When a tooth erupts into the mouth, it has to obviously come through the gingiva, and sometimes you'll get this flap as the tooth is erupting, normal process, but it gets infected. It may get infected underneath that, or it may get traumatized because the tooth up above is chomping down on this tissue becomes uh, inflamed and painful. Your job would be to recognize this in a medical office. Pericarditis is a bacterial infection. Until they can get to the dentist, warm salt water rinses. Again, warm salt water is great for any infection in the mouth. Chlorhexidine rinses. 
And again, if there is swelling with this, penicillin or amoxicillin uh, would be an appropriate choice. And if there's a penicillin allergy, um, clindamycin might be uh, the next drug of choice for dental infections. Penicillin, amoxicillin usually is our drug first choice. Uh, and if there's a penicillin allergy, go to clindamycin. And then uh, probably over-the-counter pain management. If the swelling or the pain really increases suddenly again, they need to go to the emergency room depending on the extent um, or someone needs to call uh, their local dentist or they need to come back to you and then um, you can do the appropriate therapy or call the dentist directly. The pericornitis, sometimes the dentist will take out the opposing tooth to stop the inflammation. Uh, usually they take out um, the offending tooth or the tissue. Now then, this is a much more advanced dental case. And this is one that uh, could walk into your uh, office at any time. We have a 31-year-old male with rapidly increasing right face swelling, poorly controlled diabetic, teeth concern, toothache. Started in the right lower wisdom tooth five days ago. He went to a dentist. The dentist gave penicillin. Um, actually, the dentist didn't prescribe enough penicillin. Uh, and he failed to have the patient to come back in a couple days. And I think the patient might have thought that they, you know, were adequately treated. Anyway, the patient tells you it's not working, and you can clearly see that the patient has some marked swelling on the right side of the face versus the left. There's trismus, which is always a worry. That means certainly infection if they cannot open their mouth. You can see his mouth is also deviated. He has difficulty breathing, a real worry of some sign. And as you'll see the x-rays, what this actually represents is a multiple spaced infection. Terigo, um, mandibular, buccal space, um, a very serious situation. And the temp of 101 management. This is an urgent case. Uh, most of us would, even dentists, send them directly to an emergency department and they would probably be admitted to the hospital for imaging, incision and drainage, antibiotics, try and get the sugar uh, level controlled. But let me show you, since you're all dentists now, what the x-ray would look like that the dentist took. Again, this is a panoramic image. Right side, left side, this is TMJ right side, TMJ left side, upper jaw, lower jaw, sinuses. What we have on the right side, remember right to left, left to right, teeth number one and two are both decayed. If you see the darkness, that's decay. That's decay. And the lower tooth, number 32, half of it's gone, it's decayed. So at this point, we don't know which tooth was the offending tooth, but chances are it would probably be the lower looking at that infection. It was certainly down the neck. This is a nice CT. The left side is a higher level. We see the mandible and the spinal column. And we can see this gray area and where the red arrows are, that represents purulence infection. And a little lower level, we see buccal space infection. This is all purulence. And what's really worrisome this is the airway, the little black spots here and here and here. Clearly, the airway is compromised, and that's a very serious situation. So, of course, uh, they did incision and drainage, put the patient on IV clindamycin. Um, it's actually hospitalized for four days until they actually stabilized the sugar and the swelling and the infection. Again, the important message here is this is not someone that you would give more antibiotics and tell them to come back in 48 hours. It would be, uh, it takes immediate action. Okay, case six. You look at this and it's a little shocking. Very, a lot of red, a lot of erythema, and a lot of severely decayed teeth. 23-year-old male, diagnosed one year ago. He comes in. Um, to the medical office says my teeth are crumbling 
and the top left eye tooth is killing me, which is this tooth right here. As you can see, it's fractured from decay, and you can see probably, uh, even though we can't see it, you can imagine the nerve would be right here. Gums and roof of my mouth burn. Uh, he does disclose to you that he's used methamphetamine for a year. Um, he's doing some things that you can help him discontinue. Over-the-counter peroxide three times a day is way too strong. It's going to cause some changes in the oral flora. And also he's using over-the-counter topical benzocaine four to five times a day, which is probably uh, causing some sloughing as well. Too much benzocaine can be like a chemical burn. So when you tap on tooth number 11, he jumps. That is the tooth that's most problematic. Now clearly we have a lot of irreversible teeth here. The thing to do and the thing that we would be most concerned about is after we make the diagnosis, which is acute pain, probably abscess from this maxillary left cuspid, would be, is he uh, stable in terms of his abuse program? Is he you know, off the methamphetamine? Because uh, we know users have advanced dental decay. It uh, causes the teeth to decay very quickly. They crumble just as we saw in the previous case. Uh, oftentimes it takes extractions and a lot of dental work. So the hope is uh, if he's not in uh, an abuse program, maybe we could help facilitate that, uh, do some education. Uh, and if if not, at the, at the least, we get them to the dentist and uh, get some treatment done. Now, the dentist or anyone else is going to be concerned that they are not using methamphetamine before they use local anesthesia. Uh, that can cause a severe hypertensive crisis uh, with some serious sequela. So again, this is it's a dental case, but it's a larger case. It's a, a case of abuse, and we all know how difficult those can be to manage. So we'd hopefully get the person out of pain, uh, get some work done, and then turn the situation around and make sure that they are in a good treatment program and in, in a better place. The other thing we see with this patient, the redness, would be the erythematous candidiasis, which was probably promoted by the full-strength peroxide. Uh, years ago, peroxide full-strength was used for periodontal treatment, but no more. And he uh, was using that and probably doing more damage. So we're going to refer for counseling, stop the peroxide, stop the excess benzocaine, use uh, an antifungal, fluconazole, um, and OTC biotin for uh, the dryness. It's a complex case. Um, it can start in the medical office, and then the dentist would certainly be a, a, a part of this uh, treatment plan. Another case, uh, we have a 23-year-old male again in extreme pain. This is always a bad sign, as you know. Weight loss of 10 pounds over the previous two weeks, uh, especially if they were not obese uh, to begin with. You look inside, and what you see is halitosis. They're having bad breath. You get, you know, you can tell that even from a couple uh, feet away. Usually this is pretty strong due to the bacterial infection. Uh, edematous, erythematous. See how this architecture is no longer even close to normal? It's blunted, it's inflamed, it's hyperplastic, uh, it's not hugging the teeth. We see a lot of plaque, we see a lot of calculus and tartar, along with all of this inflammation. Mobile teeth, lethargic, temp, rapid pulse that's weak. This person's sick. Not just a little periodontal disease that uh, can be handled quickly. And the other thing you have to consider when you see something like this, is what is the differential? Necrotizing periodontitis is certainly a great consideration, but you also have to consider blood dyscrasias, perhaps leukemia. And this is because their mouth is hurting and they just haven't brushed their teeth. So you can't immediately jump to necrotizing periodontitis, even though that is the probable diagnosis here and certainly be high on the list. Also think of blood dyscrasia or drug-induced immune suppression. What we would do here because of all of these combined factors, probably I would support, in this case, an emergency referral. 
I would call up their, being a dentist, I would call up their primary care physician who's handling them if they have one. And if not, we would need to go to an emergency room, probably IV fluids and stabilize them with antibiotics, analgesics, and perhaps a gingival biopsy if we're not sure that this is periodontal disease. Okay, case eight. Swellings in the mouth um, can be problematic. You don't know if it's a cyst or a malignancy sometimes. So here we have a 32-year-old male presenting with moderate pain, rapidly progressing swelling in the mandibular right area. Here and here. It's even starting to um, ulcerate uh, through the surface. And that happens sometimes with rapidly growing masses. Has AIDS CD4 of 75 and viral load of 30,000. When you actually do an exam, the tooth is mobile, and this is pretty rubbery in consistency. So, again, a physician can do a couple things. They could refer, certainly we want imaging, and they can refer to a hematology oncology. If it's uh, someone clearly who is, uh, has AIDS, who's immune suppressed, very low CD4, you worry about a lymphoma, okay? So refer to a surgeon or an ENT surgeon after you do imaging um, and do the biopsy. This was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You have to be, um, this is consistent with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the uh, thing I want to impress on physicians or dentists, whoever happens to be listening, the mouth can be the first site for a lymphoma. It could be a uh, non-specific swelling as we see here, could also be in the um, oral pharyngeal area. But a lymphoma can be an enlargement anywhere. Oftentimes, gingiva, palate, or the retropharyngeal area. These are the most common places that you might see a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And as you know, it's uh, not a rare malignancy in the HIV positive population. And it can show up in the mouth. Now then, let's jump to the other uh, issue we mentioned, spontaneous hemorrhage. Uh, this young man came into our clinic, but just assume he walks into your medical clinic, and he says, my mouth is bleeding. He was not in a lot of pain. So you do your exam. There is spontaneous bleeding around the roots of the teeth. We have some ecchymosis inside the lip and certainly a large patch here on the lateral tongue. Interestingly enough, this patient had no skin ecchymosis, no bruising. Um, but again, if you have that availability, this would not go to a dentist. This would go to a hematology oncology person because as we know, when someone's HIV infected, their coag factors uh, can be depleted um, they can have a platelet dysfunction, and it can show up in the mouth first, and that's what happened here. He had a severe coag deficiency, and once he was restored, he, he did fine, but it showed up first in the mouth. And I looked his, over arms and legs. I saw no other bruising, which really surprised me. Um, so, again, another good reason to take a look at the mouth and... Uh, offer some help if it's appropriate. Last case here is our 45-year-old male who presents, again, a routine follow-up at your office. Um, he really doesn't have a dentist. As you can see, his last dental exam was four years ago, which is, again, not atypical. Access to care in some areas is difficult for a variety of reasons that we're all too familiar with. Um, but he was compliant with his antiretroviral medication, so he just doesn't go to a dentist. Lump on my tongue is getting bigger, and now it's painful. You do a clinical oral exam. You have the left lateral tongue. This is firm to palpation. And we know for sure this has been here for quite some time. The lesion is right where I'm in the circle. It's not just this area here. When you 
do an oral exam, if you've looked at the video, you're going to put on uh, your gloves and a piece of gauze and pull the tongue out, and you're going to run your finger along the sides of the tongue. Firmness is not um, a good sign, especially when it's uh, something like this. So we have an invasive squamous cell carcinoma from here back to here. Again, another good reason to not just look at the mouth. I run my finger around the tongue, both sides. Run your finger inside the cheeks, and you're looking for any masses or lumps. That's another way to help find uh, a lymphoma. But this is a squamous cell carcinoma. And the thing about carcinomas, remember, they don't always hurt. Okay? Sometimes they don't hurt until they get large. Sometimes they're non-healing ulcers that will not really be that big a problem, which is why there's a delay in diagnosis uh, with a lot of our oral lesions. So don't let lack of pain uh, take you in the wrong direction. Now then, just to wrap this up, we're uh, coming to our end of our time here. I hope all of you would feel a little more comfortable now knowing what to look at when you do an oral exam and uh, to be able to better triage what's urgent versus what's maybe not so urgent. Um, and to hopefully think about the mouth as part of the overall care plan and try and be a little more uh, involved in doing a screening oral exam because uh, I think it's a critical step in improving the total patient care and the outcomes of our care. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities, as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket size treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. 
Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV-AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you are located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.